Welcome. Welcome to the first lecture of the School of Architecture and Environment 2024 lecture series at the University of Oregon. Especially, we welcome our guests from around the world and our speakers from Japan, Europe, and India. Anupama Kundo from India runs an office in Europe. Naomi Maki and Hiroto Kobayashi from Japan have strong professional and academic ties to the United States. My name is Haryu Nice, and I have the pleasure to moderate this lecture, which involves to introduce our distinguished guest speakers, and it also involves to handle a few questions and answers by our students. The lecture series title is called Care Of, or C slash O, and the theme of this program is C slash O time which may evoke different interpretations, but we are told to consider this title quite loosely. Maybe it means that time is much more decisive than the more tolerant space. Or maybe it is simply related to, to one of our guest speakers projects. One word about the audience of this lecture series, which includes uh, students, faculty, and community members in architecture, interior architecture, landscape architecture, and historic preservation, who will be delighted to learn about the architecture practices of our distinguished speakers, Anupama Kondo, Naomi Maki, and Hiroto Kobayashi. It is a real pleasure for me to introduce these three prominent architects, starting with Anupama. One last word on the online format of this lecture. I guess we are taking advantage of the new kinds of virtual lectures by international speakers that now can easily be presented via internet, even in this somehow distant format. We thank the SAE leadership for arranging this lecture, especially we thank the head of SAE, Aaron Moore. Now I would like to introduce Hiroto Kobayashi and Naomi Maki, both principals at KMDW in Tokyo. First, let me introduce Naomi Maki. Naomi is a founding partner of the firm Kobayashi Maki Design Workshop, KMDW, an architectural and urban design firm based in Tokyo. I remember Naomi when she was a graduate student at the University of California in Berkeley, and I was a starting assistant professor. Uh, that's almost 30 years ago or even more. I'm very happy to see her again in this context when she has become a principal in one of the most progressive architecture offices in Japan today. Naomi, Naomi received her bachelor at the Japan Women's University Tokyo in 1989. And in 1991, she received a master of architecture at the University of California in Berkeley, College of Environment Design Department of Architecture. She's now involved in a large range of diverse projects in Japan and abroad. Hiroto Kobayashi studied architecture and urban design at Kyoto University and the Harvard Graduate School of Design, GSD. He has worked with Nikken Seke and Norman Foster and Partners as an architect. He completed his doctoral dissertation on Japanese traditional community form, then received a doctor of design degree from the GSD, where he served also as a visiting associate through 2003 to 2004. Dr. Kobayashi is a founding partner of Kobayashi Maki Design Workshop, as I pointed out already. He also represents the American architectural firm Sid Skidmore Owings and Merrill, LLP, uh, SOM also called, in Japan. KMDW's work encompasses a full range of design scales from furniture and interiors to large building complexes and urban design. Projects include work for cities and communities in Japan, China, Indonesia, Myanmar, Palau, and Peru. Most recently, KMDW and Kobayashi's laboratory at KU University have been developing a design built methodology using engineered wood. This approach was inspired and initiated by the Togo disaster of 2011. Current projects of KU include a dormitory and a laboratory designed and constructed mainly by the students of KO SFC, a student-based project called Student Built Campus. 
or SBC. Here I'm particularly interested in the work on what is called the veneer house, because I was working with Masami Kobayashi, the brother of Hiroto, also on the Fukushima Tohoku disaster, but focusing more on the urban architecture design level. The veneer house project began in the wake of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in Japan. After, wit after witnessing his disaster, this disaster, Hiroto Kobayashi and the Kobayashi Laboratory at Keio University began developing a strong and flexible structural system based on CNC routed plywood components. This system allows a structural frame to be assembled quickly without advanced tools or knowledge. The first veneer house was built in 2012 in Minami Sanrico, Japan as a community center for tsunami victims. Another project in Ishinomaki, Japan was completed the following year with improved technology. The building system has continued to develop along with new projects in disaster stricken regions in Myanmar, Nepal, and the Philippines. I'm very happy to finally meet Hiroto Kobayashi in person and in an academic setting. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Maki and Hiroto Kobayashi to our first lecture of the SAA Fall 2020 lecture series. Hi. Uh, we are KMDW, and today's title is Finding Beauty in the Change of Everyday Life. Um, we would like to explain the concept of our office later. Hi. I'm sorry, I'm Hiroto. I'm Naomi. Okay. We started our office 18 years ago um, together, and uh, we luckily had many chances to uh, be involved in a uh, very different type and scale of projects so far. Uh, we had many uh, staff, sorry, <laughs> we didn't, we did we don't have many staff, but we do have staff from um, both uh, from inside of Japan, also outside from other countries too. And, uh, we believe that it owes to our personal background who we both also had uh, experience uh, studying abroad and working abroad. Our main office is located in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, we also had uh, small branch office in Berkeley, California. So now uh, we prepared two uh, sort of a themes. One is uh, connection. And we try to uh, connect people and the place as much as possible in any kind of situations. Um, uh, engineering, yes and technology, yes, and uh, local people, local culture. And then uh, we try to understand the genuine slow side of the place, uh, which is very important for us to uh, do our design work. And the second one is a temporariness. Usually temporariness is, uh, is a very short time. And then we try sort of we tend to ignore uh, that sort of a short of time or like uh, some appearance of the things. But uh, in the case of Japan, that temporaliness is very important to understand of our life, especially daily life. So we try to capture the character of temporaliness, you know, um, in our architecture, even outside of Japan, because uh, we are living in today's life and our life is now very complex. complex but we try to, we have to anyway, live in this society. So our theme is how to deal with this time in a very uh, good way and to be happy. So uh, one example of which I would like to, uh, we would like to introduce is the Ise Shrine, which is a very old temple uh, starting from, uh, 6th, 7th century. 
And, but you can see this building is very new. Interesting, interestingly, because uh, this uh, shrine, every 20 years, they rebuilt all the buildings and all the commodities and then things every 20 years and replaced by new one. So this building is very new, but exactly the same form, same material, I mean, same uh, process of making things, they succeed. And more than uh, this year, already the last time was uh, 62 times they did. So if you can see this uh, left hand side in a photo. Okay, hold on. Uh, photo. Uh, here is the old one, which is almost 20 years old. And then this one is pretty new, which was just built. And then the god inside of this old one will move to this new one. And then the uh, the vacant uh, old shrine uh, buildings will, will be demolished after this. But then uh, the god stays here 20 years. And then 20 years later, uh, another new one, but exactly the same form, exactly same uh, um, uh, material, which is uh, Japanese you know, spruce, is used, then the new one will be built. And then the god again moved to this one. So 62 times uh, the god moved. And then interestingly, these materials um, uh, will be used, reused another 20 years in different shrine. And then after that, another 20 years, uh, the materials are used you know, um, in different shrines. So total 60 years, they use the same material. And then meanwhile, they put the new tree into the forest. And then the tree grows you know, within the 60 years. So this is a very good cycle of nature, we, we understand. But at the same time, 20 years, why we said 20 years, they said 20 years is that 20 years is a good time to succeed our sort of technique to the gen next generations. So olden times people live only 50 years. So 20 years, they uh, did this uh, ceremony and then you know as assemble and then disassemble and then the carpenter can learn the system. So the building itself is very new, but the, uh, the spirits uh, is to be succeeded every 20 years. So um, idea about architecture in Japan is uh, actually has this type of character still, I believe. Okay. So this is uh, Ginza streets, which is the, the most thriving uh, and also the oldest uh, shopping streets in Tokyo, in center part of Tokyo. And then the building here, this big one, uh, this is the Ginza 6, uh, is the name of the building. And humongous building is about 100, 110 meters and then 80 meters and then 66 meter high. It's a, a big building, which was uh, exterior was designed by Yoshio Taniguchi. Uh, he is the, uh, the very well-known, you know, Japanese modern uh, modernist and architect. Uh, architect. And interestingly, um, uh, actually, I am the advisor of Ginza community. So um, this takes some like uh, about 16, 70 years to uh, you know start this project and then finish this project. And then I um, uh, work with uh, the developer and also architect. So um, I, I know that the process is, you know, how the process is gone. Then uh, the interesting part is that if you see upper part, this is office building. It's very simple, horizontal, you know, eaves so continues. But then lower part is a commercial, uh, you know, brand shops. Like this one's a Fendi and the next one is another, uh, you know, brand shop from, from Europe. And the facade uh, design is here. It's also, of course, you know, represents their sort of a brand, right? But then uh, facade will, can be replaced very easily because this is just attached to this frame, right? So even this uh, big building and also a, a very famous uh, brand building, uh, brand shop, um, they are, of course, you know, um, representing the contents of this shop, but then the facade part is replaceable. 
it's more like a temporary. Uh, that is an uh, um, interesting character of Japanese architecture. So from now on, uh, we would like to show our uh, projects. Um, this is actually the very first project that we worked. Uh, it's a summer house in Nagano Prefecture. It's like a, a two and a half hour driving from Tokyo. It's in mountain range and it gets very cold in the winter. So the uh, owner family uses this uh, house only uh, from spring through fall. And we knew that the, um, they don't use the house uh, in the winter time. So the idea was uh, to make this house uh, looking slightly different when they use and um, from when they don't. Um, we came up with the idea to cover up the window with the wooden panel, which has same material as exterior walls and open up when they stay and close it up when they leave. In order to do that, uh, uh, we used some sliding doors and some parts are uh, opened with the hinge with the gas dumper uh, technology as well. So uh, it, as you can see it very clearly, the left hand side, you will see the uh, wooden panel and became as a eave or awnings. Um, and when it's closed, uh, try to make it uh, flat so that the whole house looks like a box. Uh, that also has something to do with the, uh, our intention that we wanted to maximize the view from interior uh, living space and dining space to look out the uh, very beautiful uh, greenery. Uh, you don't see the panels uh, because the sliding doors are stored in a small uh, space next to the window. This is also one of our early projects. Uh, this is a commercial building located in the center of Tokyo. And this is a rather busy district with many office buildings and retail shops. Um, the idea was that uh, the main part or uh, factor of this building is this main uh, facade. Uh, and in order to uh, give um, humane sense of scale to the uh, street, and people uh, walk by, walking by. Uh, we designed the facade uh, dividing into small triangles and uh, giving uh, some articulations and then the uh, um, different angles and all of the triangle plate are tilted so that nothing is in the vertical um, when it comes composed together it gives the different angles with uh, reflecting lights and giving 
or creating shades. And we thought that it was very interesting also uh, feature of this project, uh, of this building. Different day, time, uh, it gives you uh, very different uh, views. It's got the uh, very transparent glass. Was that iron? No iron? The, I believe so, yeah. This is the entrance on the ground floor. The uh, plan was very simple. So, uh, uh, core elevator shafts and the structure systems and then uh, it was very challenging to work on the uh, curtain wall mainly. Okay, so for now, um, I would like to explain some uh, uh, urban project. And uh, uh, we came to DW tried to do a very small project in for you know a personal uh, use, and at the same time, we would like to work with uh, some big companies to be involved in urban design too. We are representing Skidmore and Zemero, SOM, uh, then uh, since 2014. So this project is one of the uh, three projects. Uh, that, the first one, Tokyo Midtown, located in Roppongi, the central part of Tokyo. And Master Architects is our um, SOM. Uh, Mustafa Abadan is the partner. At that time, this time, David Childs, uh, what director uh, partner at that time too. Then we work with Niken Seke. I used to work with Niken Seke, and then so I uh, was very happy to work with old you know, friends and new friends. So uh, other than this, uh, we were involved in two other big projects in Tokyo. Then in this project, um, we. Um, were involved in designing a small uh, subway station, Roppongi subway station, like this. And so I uh, would like to explain that, you know, this is a very small project, but at the same time, it's the corner of Midtown project. So it's a very uh, important corner, important place of that project. So uh, what kind of a feature uh, we uh, would like to install, I mean, have in this project, I would like to explain. So this left-hand side is original uh, station. And then the uh, subway company, they didn't want to uh, replace by new one because if they um, break this down, you have to have another permission from the government, it takes time. So they would like to reform this uh, station to a new one. So we decided to take the second part, second floor out but then the first floor, especially structure, we have to keep it. And then this is a, uh, the building, even very small, but there are many uh, columns. So for this, you know, um, uh, a flat uh, station, we don't need so many columns, but we had to have uh, many columns. And our idea is to how to sort of a conceal, how to hide columns, but at the same time, because of the column, if we can make a, some interesting sort of uh, illusion uh, in this place, uh, that would be that would be interesting. Roppongi is a place where many interesting people gather, especially evening. So um, this uh, place can be a sort of a gathering space, you know, um, uh, to meet somebody, and that's what uh, we intended to do. So we put the triangle uh, stone um, uh, bench here behind this, uh, inside of this station. And then we use uh, um, some sort of a uh, hatched, it's uh, uh, lying, which is not the film, but it's etching, yes, etched uh, sort of a finish, the vertical line. Also, we use a mirror inside and then put like a column. 
but then the mirror reflects many scenes. So really, if you look at this station, you can feel that something is strange. And then the inside, this is the, uh, the place where air goes from that, uh, from that uh, downstairs. That means the exhaust, exhaust uh, sort of a um, uh, channel here to, yeah, the air of the underground subway station. So this is just vacant. So we put the white sand or stones and the mirror and then uh, vertical, you know, has lines to make this space more like a sort of ambiguous, you know, space. Here is at night. So our idea is to um, use uh, existing building, but um, make a sort of uh, interesting uh, uh, character of this building. Uh, in the center part of a very sliding shopping town, which is the uh, Ropongi station. Okay. Again, um, compared to those two projects that we've shown, uh, now it, the location is in the mountainside. This is a weekend house for one family. Uh, and the location is in Hakone, uh, not so far from Mount Fuji, and they are famous for hot springs. So the family uh, got the land, and uh, our challenge was that the uh, topography of the site was very steep, and we've we, um, there was a small. Um, section of the uh, site which had rather which was rather flat but then the uh, difficulty was that there were so many trees uh, which were old and tall uh, in this flat area so the uh, our idea was to work on this uh, topography as well as this given condition of having uh, this tree not to be cut. Uh, the plan, the uh, whole configuration of the roof is completely square. Then the uh, perimeter of the interior kind of indicated perimeter of the uh, house itself is also square. But because of those uh, trees, these and that, and here, trees, we uh, sometimes cut off or uh, notched out the uh, corner of this spaces, also, uh, as well as uh, roof. Uh, you will see that uh, from the pictures uh, later. So as I uh, mentioned, uh, this area, you can uh, pull out or pull in the hot water from the uh, common and shared hot spring. You pay uh, some uh, 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 share. Um, some um, dollars per month, then you can get the hot spring uh, in, in, in- As a membership. Yeah, yeah you, you can, hot, uh, yes, you can buy the uh, license of using the hot spring uh, unlimited, uh, you know, 24 hours. So the uh, bathroom is the, one of the uh, most important rooms in this house and that's why they come to this house to spend over a weekend then uh, these two main the biggest two trees are uh, in the deck which is in between the interior and uh, exterior uh, you can close up this uh, courtyard with this um, net, insects net. 
so that you can use this as an interior space, kind of you know, extended and stretching out um, bathrooms and a living and dining space. So this is, again, um, not the uh, regular residential uh, house. We came up with it similar to the one we uh, show to close up the uh, house when they are not in uh, not using. And the, you can see these trees um, penetrating the roof nets and then some of the uh, space outside. So the, this is the close uh, shop. Uh, yes, you can barbecue outside of this uh, next to the kitchen and then um, the skipping down. Oh, yes. Along the topography, uh, because it's sloping, uh, the interior spaces are uh, also stepping. This is the uh, bedroom, bedroom space, but you can open up the uh, space with the sliding doors. And this uh, kitchen area is slightly uh, lower than this living space. This is the bathroom looking out the bamboo trees. Okay, so from now, um, I would like to explain one uh, specific project, which is called the Benia House. You know, Benia is a very thin uh, sliced wood uh, or peeled wood. And uh, actually this project started after the big disaster of uh, uh, Japan, uh, east, um, north, east north of Japan. Uh, we had big earthquake 2011. Then after that, we started to you know, think how to work for those people who suffered from that big disaster. So we, uh, and also the plywood company there, there are many plywood companies, manufacturers, uh, but they also suffered because of the tsunami. So our idea is to use engineered wood plywood because it's uh, affordable, also comes from natural resources. And uh, if we can provide a self-built architecture system that would be very helpful because those days it's so difficult to get the professional carpenters. And then the third uh, sort of uh, uh, theme is that, that digital fabrication technology, which can be applied. If we cut uh, wooden pieces by hand, it takes time. So uh, we decided to use uh, you know, as much uh, technology as possible. And then the fourth one, which is the most important one, is how to reconnect community. So connections, again, very important for the especially a damaged community. So uh, we try to use this house to reconnect people, which is the main concept. Then the joinery system is a very uh, uh, simple one. It's cutting a notch and inserts the boards and then uh, use some nails you know, to connect doors. Okay. That's a simple one. Even you uh, cut by hand, hand saw, that's also possible. But the other one is more like a, a little bit advanced one, which uh, usually we use a CNC router. But the technique, uh, the joinery system comes from a very old uh, wisdom of Japanese wooden joinery. Uh, we didn't use nails so much when, you know, long uh, olden times. So we learn uh, from them. And then this type of, you know, uh, the very complicated, uh, a little bit complicated uh, joiner systems, actually, uh, we learn from them. And then we use a uh, uh, so called uh, wedge, you know, to fix everything. So these are the layout, panel layout. Uh, we tried to try not to waste you know much wood as possible 
This is the second project, which is a fisherman's uh, meeting house. And we uh, use a local plywood. Local means uh, wood comes from local. And uh, we actually uh, had uh, asked the fishermen to build this building by themselves. So they, uh, you know, uh, went fishing uh, two o'clock in the morning and come back at 10 o'clock in the morning. But after that, until two o'clock in the afternoon, they were for four, almost four hours every day. And we uh, tried to provide, uh, you know, um, that manual to let them understand the system itself. Uh, this is not the usual way to build a building. That's why, you know, it takes some time for them to understand why we have to do this and why we have to do that. So uh, first, like uh, they, they sort of complain, you know, uh, you know, we don't know the system and why do we, you know, why don't we work as sort of, a, you know, it's usual, usual way. But they gradually said that uh, this is fun. It's like a Lego. It's like a plastic model, you know. And then we have manual and assemble and this and that. So if you can see this photo, they're smiling, and then I'm very relieved to see this thing. They work uh, very hard, and even the slanted wall, slanted roof, they don't care, you know, because it's, they usually like on the you know ship, you know, very uh, sort of you know, moving. Uh, uh, boats, you know, so it's it's easy for them. So uh, this is Watanabe-san. Uh, I was very impressed because this is the last day we uh, started to clean this, you know, house everywhere. And then he came um, every day. He worked very hard. And then what he did just before this photo is that he uh, just uh, um, rolled uh, the, uh, the cloth uh, into the chopsticks and then push into uh, it, push it into the corner of this uh, uh, window. And it's invisible. Nobody can recognize that you know, it's dusty or not, but he did because I believe that this, this building is already belonging to him. And he has a sense of ownership already this time. So I found that um, the process, um, you know, the users uh, uh, are involved in uh, construction, the process of building a building that really nurtures the sense of ownership, which is very important um, idea, which I, I learned from this project. So finally we did, and it's really, uh, really uh, well done. And every year I go back and then uh, whenever I go back, you know, some new things happen, like a new shelf added new table added and then so they amend this building by themselves there's no complaint from them so uh really a uh, sense of ownership commitment is uh, very important we learn this is sort of a temporary building uh you know compared with the western uh notion the building itself maybe it lasts 20 30 years yes but then uh western standard 20 30 is a temporary right so temporary building is uh, uh, still very important for this moment. Uh, maybe later they will build a very stiff, you know, uh, 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 hard building. But I believe that this can be very help to connect, you know, reconnect people. Mothers also work very hard. This is a uh, uh, some uh, beach house. Uh, every uh, summer. Uh, some uh, community uh, built like a, this type of beach house for two months for using for, you know, for, for the beach activities. So we are asked to design this building without using, without using any nail because uh, usual summer houses like this beach house. And then uh, they use, usually use a lot of nails to assemble this one. But then in the fall, in fall, they dismantle this one and then throw all the nails into the beach. And it's very dangerous. So one NPO started to clean these nails and then clean the beach to take all the nails. And then they contacted us and then you know, asked us to design a non-nail nailed beach house. So we didn't use any nail for this building. And the system is very easy. Uh, we, as, we sort of invented the uh, so-called thrust joints using uh, some wedge and then connect these, you know, these 
piece and this piece. And then we can have a flap, usually like uh, uh, something coming out and then wedge, you know, push into from outside. But this is you know, pushed from inside. So we can have a flush joint. This flush part is very important because we have to have a, a membrane on top. So if something coming out, the membrane is broken. So this is the process. And we started from nine o'clock and about 20 people worked. But then uh, only three hours, we could assemble this one because only six or seven kind of pieces uh, you know, uh, are the pieces of this uh, element. That's why it's easy, just repeat. And then that, uh, that process is very uh, simple. And uh, these are my students and you know, uh, we worked very hard, but they really feel that sense of ownership too. So at the same time, uh, kids uh, drew some paint on membrane and every year the fish comes back. So uh, the idea is every summer, uh, this year we did the fifth time, uh, every summer, you know, kids join and then drew uh, fish. So, and then the main blame, uh, finally, we just put it, you know, on the top. And then after that, uh, we work with kids again to assemble a small piece, small uh, shop inside, which is uh, to be an uh, office of uh, uh, sick, uh, safety guards of the beach. So these two kids worked very hard. So it's a sort of a reward, you know, they can go up and, and see the beach. So here's the one. I think maybe we have to finish in four or five minutes. This is a small uh, Kumamoto booth because there is an, another earthquake, Kumamoto, uh, 2016. So we provided a very small uh, booth, which is uh, uh, easily assembled, about one hour to assemble this one, uh, five to six square meters. And uh, this can be used as a sort of a vendor kiosk. But, but at the same, because it, there's some, uh, you know, casters here. So, but this can be used to sleep, you know, uh, outside of the house. The house itself, they cannot live because it's dangerous, but uh, they cannot leave house. That's why they uh, uh, stayed in a car or a tent. That's why we provided this uh, wooden small house. This is, of course, dismantable and can be used in different ways. So this is axonometric and there are several ways to use. So we provide another, but similar type, you know, for kids bookshop uh, for one event. So this uh, small sh uh, house is small booth is good enough for kids. And then they enjoyed reading books like this. So we were involved in uh, uh, several communities all over the world, and uh, we provided this type of uh, uh, these type of types of uh, uh, venue houses. And uh, our office came in DW, and our my I'm teaching at Keio University. Then my students also have been involved in this project. So these are the places where we uh, work for. Then, uh, of course, you know, uh, there are many uh, venues in Japan, but um, Europe and some America, uh, yeah, which actually we, we are doing. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Uh, KMDW, uh, we are willing to um, uh, work for the people and we try to understand our local culture and then try to reflect the culture into the architecture. And hopefully that uh, if you see this presentation, if you're involved, if you are sort of encouraged by designing an architecture or urbanism, that would be that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much for a fantastic lecture and all this richness that you have. And the veneer house, of course, is highly interesting in our times. And I also enjoyed very much the the uh, houses in the in the mountains that uh, you built with incredible care. I mean, that was also very wonderful. But I think our students have questions. And uh, if I can invite you to ask those questions. Yeah. 
I'll go ahead and go first. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, you reminded me of some things I'd heard of before and I'd forgotten about like the ESA shrine. So I really appreciate the reminder um, for that as well. I wanted to know, um, you mentioned that you learned something with the importance of construction for the user, their involvement in that process. I wanted to know if you could expand more on how maybe that changed the way that you designed um, and built structures. Yeah. Especially the Vineyard House project, uh, we uh, really focused on uh, to simplify the construction method. If we use a machine, then all of a sudden amateur people cannot join, right? So the simplest way is, okay, just hammer. So you can just hammer, right? And then if you use nail, and again, you know, some amateur, <laughs> including maybe she and me, sometimes it's very difficult, right? To hit nails. That's why, um, you know, how to simplify that construction system is the issue always. Then I learned that, you know, uh, just uh, hammering the, the wedge, it's easy. Even like a five-year kid, you know, can, they can do. Yeah. So we decided to not to use nail, but to use a, you know, CNC router to have a, even a complicated detail. So idea to let them involved in is that simplify the building system. Also, if we can just uh, let them involved in design parts, that would be fantastic. So my so our next issue is how to let them involved in design phase. Right. Not so easy, but <laughs> Joshua, do you have a question? Yes, I do actually. Yeah. Thank you both very much for that presentation. Um, you know, the the modular design um, I think is is very interesting and just you know the way to incorporate that. Um, you know, it can be applied in, in various different projects. Um, specifically, I'm kind of brought to mind of a, a community project I just worked on um, helping the, the unhoused population down here and how that might be applied as temporary structures. But um, along a different train of thought, um, we were, you had discussed the, this idea of temporariness in architecture and in school we're taught you know about the the temporary nature of our buildings these days and how they last you know 20 to 30 years um, and that's generally something um, that's kind of thought to be undesired um, and how we're trying to kind of increase the, the permanence of our buildings and the flexibility of their use and um, these these two ideas kind of seem to be at odds with each other a little bit and I'm, I'm curious um, if you can maybe expand on how um, those ideas can kind of be reconciled. Mm. Yeah. Um, for us, temporary building uh, like last like a 20, 30 years, it's, uh, it's good enough. Then these days, you know, we tend to move you know, from one place to another. Right? So we change a place to live. So you know, in that situation, maybe, you know, houses can be changed easily. You know, that, that's, uh, that's one idea. Also, um, if you can arrange your space, like uh, every week, you know, uh, uh, this weekend we will have a mother, step, you know, mother-in-law. So we have to have a bedroom here and then we can arrange you know, the space. And then uh, Monday, okay, go back. She, she goes back and then, you know, go back to normal and then change again, right? Uh, actually, Japanese uh, tatami mat room, which is a very flat, you know, space. Uh, at night, it becomes a bedroom, and then you know, daytime is a dining room, and then study room, right? And then if you like to have a guest, you have a folding screen, and then divide the you know, space into two, right? So always sort of an idea about space in Japan is more flexible. You know? So we are accustomed to that kind of you know, sort of idea, right? Then the beauty is that you know, these days, you know, really society changes so fast. So even if we design some stable, some permanent uh, structure and then uh, design space itself, the situation changes and the, we ourselves it changes. Right? So, so I think maybe, um, yes, flexibly, you know, change, changeable is very, very important. So um, we, um, uh, the, the building made in wood, uh, which is actually very easy to add or, you know, or de you know detracts. You know, easily. 
if you build the building on concrete, it's so difficult to arrange the space. Yeah? Um, we have a summer house, uh, which was designed by um, her father. And then, you know, his father is an architect and he designed that wooden house. It's very rare in a sense. But then um, he wanted to expand uh, because, you know, uh, more family, you know, added. Yeah. And then one summer he did and he found that it was so easy. And I said that oh, this is made in wood. <laughs> it's not concrete. Yeah. And next summer he did again, another extension. <laughs> It was almost every summer, like a one meter extended, one <laughs> meter extended. You know, that is a sort of a Japanese architecture. It's easy to add and detract. You know, um, idea about change is very important. Then that's why I'm sort of we are discussing about you know how to make things transitional. So transitional house, especially after the big disaster, usually you know it's not so comfortable. Yes, you know, very uh, small and made of steel. Right. But nowadays, we really pay a lot of attention to even have a temporary house, transitional house, made in wood. And then some people really liked it. You know? So I think maybe temporariness and then the quality of space is not, you know, one-on-one -on -one relationship. Always we can, uh, you know, upgrade the space quality, even traditional house. That's what I'm thinking. So flexibility is very important from now on. I would also like to ask a question, and I think uh, uh, seeing your work, I would like to ask the same question uh, as I asked uh, Apunama, because the notion of beauty, she referred to the uh, beauty in Ikebana, of course, is very relevant in Japanese uh, design, architecture, landscape architecture. How do you relate uh, um, to beauty in your work? Because in some ways the veneer house is more utilitarian, but there's also some beauty in it, and I'm not sure quite how to get my hand my hand on it. So I'm sure you can say something. And also about the the uh, in the um, summer houses that you built, it's much more easy to see the beauty immediately. So uh, anyway, that's my my perception. What is what is your uh, take on on this? What you are doing with regard to beauty? The um well um these days um on the Japanese market the uh, residential market you can uh you uh easily get the high High quality means that they are um, manufactured in a, um, in advance, uh, you know, off site, then bring to the site and assemble it um, very quickly with a very um, um, well um, well built and well made. In that sense, um, it looks very smooth and beautiful, and many people like to buy those houses, mm -hmm. uh, maybe in apartment houses and uh, uh, single family houses. It doesn't matter the design, but the quality wise. But it's too, for us, it's too standardized. And the uh, two houses that we showed on the slides were rather crafted, I would say. And the veneer house has a similar quality with that, even though um, they are handcrafted. So the, um, you can find some roughness in the finished because um, I think this is still the uh, challenge part of the veneer house is that when uh, you use the even CNC router, but if it's not a uh, high grade router, you need to sand, you know, with the paper, mm -hmm. um, paper sand uh, to take out the small um, some leftover piece, you know, it's uh, yeah. itchy one. <laughs> <laughs> and, but because it could be very dangerous, someone get you know easily hurt yeah. with these things. So um, 
after sand it, it gets a little roundish. It's not super sharp uh, edge anymore, but it doesn't, uh, it, it's still you know good enough to be assembled. But as a whole, you can see some um, still, um, I would say roughness with it, but that's the beauty of the uh, whole thing, you know, the roughness um, stands for the process, I would say. Right. Yeah. I actually found that, you know, her, um, uh, project in India is really beautiful because of the, that each, you know, brick has different shape. You know? <laughs> In Japan, like a precision, this you know should be perfect, exactly the same, and then you know straight line, and that precision actually is required you know, in architecture, you know, construction. It's really beautiful, but for me, for us, it's a little bit too much. <laughs> we need something, you know, some like uh, uh, you know um, idea about you know we made it, or somebody that made it for us, you know. That kind of handmade sort of a sense is very important still, especially these days. That's why, um, you know, about materiality, uh, we try to use, uh, you know, the raw material as much as much as possible. Some people would like to have a, you know, fine finish, wooden pattern with plastic, you know, <laughs> like a sheet part, you know, sheet like added, right? It's, and it looks very nice, but it's plastic, yeah? because it's maintenance fully, right? That's terrible for me. <laughs> That's why, of course, every time you have to take care of it, because you, this is your building. Right? Every year we uh, replace, you know, the shoji screen, we have a paper, washi paper, right? But every year we just uh, take it down and then put it again, new one. That kind of uh, ritual is very important for us to welcome new year. Right? So always we have to spend uh, more time, actually taking time, right? More time. To really uh, to sort of maintain ourselves or maintain our culture, but these days efficiency and then you know uh, compactness and you know uh, everything just okay. Just ignore this, you know. Why don't you just make it very dense and simple and right? So omit this process and omit that process. But I would like to recover. We would like to recover that kind of uh, you know making process, which is very important to nurture people's you know sort of a sense of ownership sense of making things. That's why um, uh, we agree that, you know, we really um, uh, would like to have, sort of a recover sort of craftsmanship, you know, uh, even uh, by not, uh, amateur people. That's what we're that we thinking. Well, thank you very much, Naomi and Hiroto for your views on beauty. And I think they are not so dissimilar from uh, Apunamas, because there's some definitely some overlap and some understanding in the roughness of it and the smoothness. So there's nothing, there's no one beauty. There's a beauty that uh, uh, is possible in many different ways. And that's uh, uh, one of the conclusions. So thank you very much for this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. You. So now let me introduce Anupama Kondo. Anupama Kondo was born in Pune, India in 1967. She graduated from S from Sir JJ College of Architecture, University of Mumbai in 1989 and received her PhD degree from the TU Berlin. Eight, her research oriented practice is focusing on material research to achieve architecture of low environment environmental impact while being socio-economically beneficial. Her work was exhibited twice at the Venice Architecture Biennale with the installation Feel the Ground, Wall House 1 to 1 in 2012, and Building Knowledge, an Inventory of Strat Strategies in 2016, and is currently exhibited as a solo show taking time at Luciana Museum of Modern Art Denmark in 2020. Anupama Kundo's practice started in 1990 in Auroville, India, where she worked closely with Roger Anger on Auroville's planning, particularly the urban design of Auroville city center, 
administration zone and habitat area. She taught urban management at the TU Berlin and strengthened her expertise in rapid urbanization and climate change related development issues about which she has written extensively. She's the author of the bilingual book, Roger Angers, Research on Beauty, Recherche sur la beauté, Architecture 1958 to 2008, published in Berlin by Jovis Verlag in 2009. Here I'm particularly interested in Aponama's notion of beauty since I'm part of an office in Berkeley, California that also explicitly works with the notion of beauty. And I believe that I could observe some similarities in her early works in residences and in, uh, in, uh, in and around Oroville that have a very raw beauty, very rough, but soft at the same time. In particular, the wall house impressed me a lot in this way I'm not sure if she will talk about this today, but I and my students are very interested in this often elusive quality of beauty in architecture. Please join me in welcoming Anapuma Kondo. Okay, so uh, let me start by saying hello to everyone and avoiding good morning, good evening, good afternoon, because we are all in different time zones. Uh, but really happy to meet you despite uh, all the difficulties we are all facing. But since uh, we had, we have all had some time to reflect and take, uh, you know, our, our taking much more time at home and re-managing our time, personal time, I thought of, uh, I, I mean, it came really timely for me because I was working on an exhibition of my work for the last four years to be shown at Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. And I had anyway been looking upon time as a resource, you know, and I would like to show my architectural research and um, uh, projects through this perspective, having just come back from opening that exhibition. And, and uh, I found it very timely with the COVID crisis to really, start with the essentials of what it is we aspire for. And I thought of sharing my own preoccupations and what kind of practice it led to. And therefore I've uh, taken the title, Taking Time. I don't mean to um, emphasize the slowness or delaying. I mean to talk about proactively using and taking time to do the things that matter to us, as opposed to just uh, not attending to the difficult work we have to do. Because uh, in the end, that time taken will leave us enriched and more capable to face our future. So I come from India where we have, uh, it's an old civilization and um, we have grown up looking at architecture created generations before us that still stand strong. And uh, you can see through the architecture of various aspects that there is a direct material co connect. Mat the materials used to build the space come directly from where you can see the relationship. But you realize that it's not only about the material, it's about the way the materials got crafted and refined work and luxury had to do with the human intellect and human engagement with those available materials that made any material be transformed into something useful. And, uh, and it not only for useful for that generation, it took a lot of time for people to create these things. It took lifetimes sometimes, but we worked there was, there was a different way of positioning yourself as an architect and not starting with yourself and from wherever you are, you know. So this, from this sort of uh, beginnings uh, to looking at how, what are the current challenges of rapid urbanization that we talk about, there's a, such a strong sense of urgency for, it, it, we, to quickly come up with solutions. I feel very uncomfortable about the way we've been cutting back on time required to do things well. 
And that kind of hasty, hasty responses have led to, in this uh, moments where we have um, capitalist driven rapid urbanization and where everything, we, we, we are very busy with trying to conserve all resources rather than our own uh, time. We, we, we're not looking at the human resources alongside natural resources. So I asked myself, at what cost are we saving time? Isn't it too costly for the planet if we cut back on our time and, in, and therefore spend a lot of resources? So that's where I'm coming from. And I want to just explain some of the current challenges in India. I, I, I come from Bombay. Uh, so, you know, we have huge population. The current way of uh, the globally accepted standards of building and of consuming for building is such that only few can have that standard. The rest become homeless as a result. We, we started creating new social form of segregation and affordability has become a big problem everywhere in the world. And those standard towers that are planted all over the world, whether it is Frankfurt, Hong Kong, Dubai, anywhere, we have everywhere the same thing now in the form of, in the name of contemporary, and we know very well what it needs to keep that, to feed that sort of thing. And it creates all of this. So alongside these concerns, I was always worried about the, the, the resources spent and even the ugliness that we were producing at such a rapid speed and whether it has any sense at all to be doing that with all our knowledge and to be part of such a system. And, and the fact that all the rich, diverse building traditions that every country, every local area had learned with various materials uh, to a, a be able to produce a very rich vernacular architecture, all of that has been now replaced by the new vernacular, which is reinforced cement concrete. And it's not very intelligently used. Even bricks that you see here, it's the, it's the standard material now. And even the bricks are not allowed to take any load. It's just there to fill something. So it's a very poor, um, I think in, in, in the hurry that we have to, I mean, in, uh, trying to save our time, we are also, we are not producing anything intelligent or worth leaving behind, I think. Even, uh, even if we spent a lot of resources, we, uh, poor, poor next generation, you know, is what I was thinking. So I wanted to just, you know, say this sentence, you know, that I, it came to my head, but this is a quote now from Peter Drucker. There is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. This is my, this was my mood when I graduated. Okay. And I, I, I'm sorry to say that each year I'm more and more convinced about that. So I tried to first and foremost, not do, do, not be in any anxiety to do things just because I have to pay my life. I have to, it's better not to just do some, create this economy, create, just for me to have all of us to feel worried about our personal economies in the name of our, you know, our profession, we are probably doing a lot of things which we could reconsider. So the first step for me, and I'm gonna walk you now through my journey, 30 years ago, when I so-called uh, dropped the so-called rat race, you know, and uh, people say it was a big risk taken. And I did pay a heavy price for, I don't recommend that students should follow my example because there's no guarantee where it'll take you. But uh, I paid a very big price for, for that. But today I'm ready to pay twice the what I paid because I feel rewarded personally, you know, what I did is I, I tried to, you know, explore my rural area and, and I, I landed up in a place called Oroville. Uh, and I li lived for 10 years in a very simple way. Because at that time, I was just trying to buy time for my me to think before I act. Because I, I knew that I was very passionate about my profession, but I just didn't want to be part of a large machinery and be part of the thing which I considered to be a problem because I felt we were building many more problems than solutions. And I 
thought it's worth really think, rethinking everything. So the first project I did was a very simple house for myself. Uh, and it, it represented, you know, it was built with round wood, natural materials, granite pillars, uh, just uh, placed inside the earth so that it can move a little bit with the rope joints and so on, very simple. But this simplicity, it was not as if it was without architectural thinking, but I realized that even if you use round wood as opposed to timber, there's a huge time saving involved. You can use a much younger tree. You could probably use a three year old um, member rather than a 25 year old, you know? And so, I mean, there is a time aspect in all of this. That this actually allows reforestation to be a realistic uh, way forward. So, but it was, for me, it was an integral solution to look at how to keep a certain dignity in your life and uh, use design and allow the design to actually create the design of the void not be obsessed with any material, but use whatever's around you in a certain, with knowledge and elegance and create a certain sense of beauty regardless of the budget. And so this is the first um, experience of what is possible. And this encouraged me, we had a solar panel on my roof, a very, very simple life, but you know, without calling it green infrastructure and all this kind of words, it was just a simple way to live uh, in a kind of with it with integrity, you know, to to my own, uh, not to create a conflict between my ideals and the daily life. So through this, the times that I saved in this kind of lifestyle, I started using the time to understand when I moved from Bombay to, a, to the local area, I thought there was nothing around me. But today I realized that I, everything I look at is a material that I could possibly use. Because it's not, it's just that by slowing down, it's my eye that got cultivated and my mind that got cultivated over the years because I gave it the time. So if I pass on a bicycle, I'm going to notice much more than if, and if I have a little bit of time to wander, I will do something with what I saw. You know, I may not otherwise notice if I'm rushing around. So I discovered, you know, how people in that area in Tamil Nadu extracted by hand materials from their place. They used to make grinding stones traditionally for, for masalas. But I realized there were skills associated to the territory and the territory, the materiality of their architecture had to do with the existing landscape, but because it remained in the human scale, it's very different from a quarry, which would be industrially managed. So I realized that it's not about this being a good material and that being a bad material. It is all about the human scale that makes it sustainable or not. We are, if you are going to accept the machine scale and over standardization, all it all because we want to save time. Then that that you and today we say brick has so much energy. This is bad. This is good. Instead of seeing at what scale is it produced, and I realized it's a qualitative difference that it completely altered my thinking. You know these observations. But I started using some of these um, very traditional available skills in a very contemporary work. But for example, I've always had a leaning also towards efficiency in the engineering sense. That means efficiency as in if, if my knowledge of engineering can allow me to use much less volume of material, no matter what material, but let, this, let me pay rather people better for their skills. That was a very easy formula for socioeconomic uh, sustainability, I would say. And so I went ahead with those methods, like you see these stones, these are hand dressed and they are inserted and they balance each other. It was for a very expensive showroom, but it diverts the funds in the direction of people I feel should be helped. So those people are called unskilled laborers, you know, otherwise. But I started as the years passed, I started discovering in the same area where I thought there was nothing, I only saw barren land when I was new. But today, all the works I'm going to show you came out of not only, uh, you know, if you, if you learned how to see, there is so much going on. 
even where it looks like there's nothing. So um, I'll show you some of those things. So as I went along, um, I have produced many other projects out of stone, natural stone, and people usually tell you it will be too expensive in these standardized times. Everyone says anything that you're going to do, anything different, they'll say it's too expensive it's a, as if it's a general cost. You know, if you go into the details and if you take the time to actually count for yourself, it is not so. I've repeatedly found out that it's not so. These are myths that I, I it empowered me with each subsequent project to realize that I, what can I do? And none of these buildings came at a higher cost. Yes, it took more time, but even the time spent and the final cost in, uh, you know, dollars per square meter would it's it's very very cost competitive i would say plus you feel go back feeling good and each project you do creates a sense of knowledge building knowledge but also building community not only building buildings so every experiment makes you more capable to do the next one and there there's a constantly growing community out of it so these similarly i have explored other materials i found out that in that area when they they baked bricks after the monsoon, you found these very traditional kilns. And of course, those kilns were not very popular. I mean, those bricks were, were less strong than the factory ones, you know. So we tend to always not want them anymore. But I realized that looking at it from the environmental perspective, you see such kind of brick kilns are people are using spending the clay that collects uh, after the at the time where they can't do rice plantations, you know, so it's part of that whole territorial activity. So if I stop buying their bricks, I perhaps make the rice growing expensive, or the the wood that I used for my first house was the same one that they plant in order they cut the thinnings to do fire the brick. So brick is not just about what energy our manuals tell us that they spend. This brick is very different from factory brick. And I started realizing the subtleties that it's about the belonging of this technology to that place. And if it is done, they don't just make any amount of bricks to get any amount of orders. They, they spend the clay that gathers. That's a very different approach. And they spend the fuel that they've harvested. And it's even if that has a bad carbon footprint, it's not the same as if this brick, which the resulting brick and the resulting lime that is produced from this local area by communities who live off that activity because that raw material is available. If I use those kind of things, you know, then of course I may get a weaker brick, but that means my wall is gonna be thicker and it still makes sense for me to use it. And these are the learnings I took away from the time I spent. And it's not like I'm looking for, I'm not at all nostalgic or looking for vernacular materials as such. I knew that my architecture is defined not by how that object looks in a rendering, but how is the space? And the space was contemporary and it was made with timeless materials, but assembled in new ways, rather than frantically trying to invent new materials for their own sake. So, I mean, I as I went along, I found in all these insignificant looking huts, I discovered, um, you know, I discovered in this case, for example, uh, the potters communities, people trying to sell pots. I started making roofing systems out of them. And as I went along very slowly over the last 30 years, I've come out with so many different things effortlessly, I would say, because it's not like a huge effort to be successful. It's just like meeting one more potter there, trying one thing here beside, you know, and look at the way this is being fired with coconut shells. And, uh, but always behind it was the engineering knowledge that will, or the quest to build many more cubic meters of architecture with less material through more knowledge. For me, that is an advancement of the human being, you know, and it's an evolution. Uh, I don't want to start from myself. I'm happy to save a little bit of resources because our population seems to not uh, come down, you know, but need more. It doesn't help if my, the square meters, despite all technological advances, if they consume way more resources than our grandparents, wouldn't help. 
it will only lead to problems. So, you know, so th these are my early years where we were figuring these type of things out, you know, where I started coming out with endless solutions. When I now look at it, I have created a palette of many, you know, insulating roofing systems. Um, there is no structural steel required for it. And then I started discovering, sometimes I worked with the same community with a new idea, like here I discovered that the cooking pots that they make but cannot sell anymore can be used to make waffle slabs and lo with lost shuttering in terracotta. So these are all structural solutions to save 60% of steel in this case, because you can skip two bars of steel uh, through this kind of methods or I've, these are uh, extrusions uh, of terracotta with which, you know, there are, there are imperfections because these are handmade, but it's all designed to produce a whole gra uh, grammar of, you know, there's a building language of things that can be produced with all the material available here and various skills. So this is one example of the architecture. This one is got quite known because this was my next house. After 10 years later, I got out of the hut and even the bricks that you see here are those very weak bricks. And um, I wanted to be proud of them and have it as an exposed brickwork. Even though we have monsoon, I wanted to show people that I believe in it. So I, I crafted with all the imperfections, I've showed them off and I brought in that artisanal quality by designing those joints, figuring out what kind of details uh, would work. And so even though I was originally not obsessed with material, I felt like I didn't want to bring, uh, and for me, the material was not important. It was about the space, but I landed up being known for material research, which is so uh, ironical uh, in the end. Uh, but uh, so yeah, this is, this, these are some pictures of the house. And th there are some ferro cement doors, which you see on the side, and I will explain some of this later. But this is a, this kind of approach led me to experiment a lot. And, um, and then when I built in other places, I continued my brick research with their bricks or according to what I scanned in the site and found as a potential, sometimes it was, uh, it was critically looking at uh, existing materials or existing skills. Oh, and there were all kinds of negotiations between high tech and low tech. What is the right way to go? So this is a daycare center which has terracotta walls to allow ventilation. And sometimes according to the, the need and the span and this, most of these projects are very simple and humble with their humble budgets. But the one of the most radical projects I ever did is called Baked in Situ Earth Construction. So Ray Meeker, a Californian ceramist had pioneered the technology of baking large scale mud houses and I wrote my PhD about him actually. And I had built a few houses in this technique. And uh, one of them, which I'm gonna show you is um, uh, ho homes for homeless children. And what this technique does is that you build a mud house and you cook it in situ. The idea is to even save the cement. So instead of taking bricks to a factory to be made, you bring the fire to the house. And it's very comp it's more complex than it sounds, but I used to do all kinds of radical experimentation. By then I started getting less and less afraid and more and more excited about discovering more about, uh, you know, realizing there's so much to discover still. And a brick is not just a brick. This is another way of doing brick where you don't even need cement. So the house is a mud construction and then because you know, it, it comes from the idea that about 40% of the heat gets absorbed by the kiln wall in each firing. It's a tremendous loss of energy. So if we treat the house as a kiln and treat the inside space as an oven and produce other ceramic material, including tiles and wash basins and whatever we want and cook them together. And we try to tap that heat and permanently cook um, the, mud structure. So uh, there's not too much time to elaborate, but these are all things you can follow up on the website, but I just sort of, sort of trying to give a spectrum of research that was done and how everything looks 
it looks like each of these innovations are very difficult, but if you just give little time to it, every project just makes you be more able to handle the research and you know and then you collect quite a lot of experience over the years so this is one of the very very exciting projects so the house gets fired and the products can be either sold to recover the house or they could be used to finish the building so it's a very very new way of looking at how how uh, the buildings as not as consumers of building materials but as producers of homes, as producers of building materials locally. So this was interesting for me. This is how we finally ended that project. Um, see, again, it was a very humble project with no funds. So all these were being done to, because you, when you have nothing, you become clever, you know, you have nothing, you have to be ingenious. That's the only thing you have. See, what we all have equally is 24 hours in the day. We are rich or poor, we all have brains, we have muscles. When you're alive, you have human resources. So it's not right to say we have nothing. We have, we have a lot. And I think our own resources are finally much more important for our advancement than just having ready-made everything done and you are bored as a human. So I realized that actually I'm happy to have this challenge because it's very rewarding. So I also did research with concrete to be able to economize significant like a lot of the structures done uh, like here uh, this is about ferro cement loss shuttering used to cast efficient beams and uh, you know um, so I'm I don't have like a, any religious approach to any material I just like to look at what is the advantage so here you see people are carrying this ferro cement mold that will allow us to build an efficient beam so I've done many buildings where concrete, this is a library, you know, concrete has been equally used with large cantilevers to minimize very thin sections of concrete. This is the town hall complex with very big spans. And having worked a lot with concrete and uh, ferro cement, I have like here you see the railings are made of ferro cement and then I have that's another material I have researched very extensively uh, ferro cement where instead of using large diameters of steel, we use very thin meshes. And now I have been researching uh, it's a material that uh, uh, Nervi had worked a lot with, but we've continued researching. Uh, you know i've been also working with trying to have a substitute, you know, with glass fibers natural fibers, etc. So here we are working on materiality as well as form, because if, since the material is so thin, you need to fold it and strengthen by folding and bending. And through this kind of discoveries of how form could lend strength, we have been looking at lately for disaster relief, how can we uh, cast it on paper? So that form work is one of the biggest challenges for efficient concrete. So the shells are faceted, so there's no wastage of anything. And then you can carry the form and you can, you know, apply very little mesh, as you can see, and you can produce uh, in a week's time, you can produce the roof over your head. So these are just some experimental projects now I'm showing you, which are just what I'm still preoccupied with. Ferro cement is a material I'm uh, are really looking at as a future. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of promise, I feel, for the future. So the, the prefabricated version of it is, again, masons can produce it in their backyards of their houses. They don't have to work in factories. We can go and collect these modules, Lego type crates, which contain your furniture, etc. And then they can be assembled in a week's time to produce housing rapidly. So the thing is, I'm not trying to say that I don't want to build quick solutions, but the research for such things takes years. You can't start when the disaster did happen. You have to take the time in advance. We know climate change is coming. We need to really give time to real new stuff. So, you know, these are some of those examples of how you could apply and build offices, houses. And over the years, I've managed to use my exhibition uh, opportunities to test some of that research. So I've, I've, I've gone to German laboratories, tested some of these new materials to see how they could have seismic 
properties or not. And we've applied it for all kinds of things. This is a prefabricated toilet and uh, you know, India has a sanitation issue. So you can have showered toilet modules put up in a day. And then a few housing projects, this is rammed earth, but also, you know, working with uh, people's participation for co-housing projects is another area where I think the future needs research, where people could offset costs of building by having an opportunity to participate if they want in different degrees, according to their abilities. So technologies can't be the alienating factor. Otherwise we will make our architecture very expensive, especially housing. So I've tried to bring in technologies that allow people, there are experts, but there are, if people want to participate, we have to come down with the technology to allow people to actually do something and not just chase any standardized thing that catalogs offer you. And so these are the kind of, uh, you know, uh, strategies for building communities with streets on upper levels um, and, you know, some other hostel buildings etc that I have also built. I'm very currently uh, focused on housing. And, um, and finally, I want to just touch upon um, some experiments done with students. As a teacher, I like to have my students experience real materials in real scale with real places and you know, and just have an encounter to be able to work out. So we've done a lot of things with urban waste, but it's mainly to be able to like this Tetra Pak project, it was filled back with sand or water in Mexico, we built used it as a building material, we were just building with whatever you find. <clears throat> or for example, I've uh, used books, books are also a source of building waste, you know, it's incredible how much urban waste uh, is through books, it's very sad. But we've made a pavilion with vacuum packed books in Barcelona, where we uh, made canopies out of it. Uh, and also these are art installations. So, you know, it's just to bring the attention to those issues also, but also just for four or five months in order not to waste any material, we are just building with whatever garbage we found. So on the way to the garbage handling, at least you can uh, do something with it for, you know. So I often work with my students looking at you know, what can be built with anything. It's just a way of learning and exploring because if you build a unique architecture with unconventional materials, then you'll go back and even look at a brick in a new way. You look at everything as if it could still, other, you know, you tend to think bricks have to be used like this, but you real, realize that, that the possibilities are endless. And uh, this is something we are doing with denim waste because all the leftover of the genes that are cut out in India to export are in heaps of garbage. So we are trying to work on all of these materials. So basically this is the direction of my curiosity. And then the contagious impact that has with my students, we bring in machines if we require to the studio, we take students to look at what is the second life of, a, of a, you know, like for example, uh, when we did the Venice Biennale, we, decided to what is going to happen after that project so we've done a project with to help the refugees to upgrade their facilities but i mean so it's not only our building knowledge it's very much about building communities as well and just seeing what is it that people can do and what can be built upon you know so these are all those examples this was a watchtower done with aa students and some work on ferro cement exploring form. And now this is a very recent furniture series done with books, old catalogs. And I would like to end with um, a few images of, uh, because I spoke about Auroville, I just want to mention that one of my projects, uh, prominent projects is a co-housing project that I've designed based on Roger Angers plan uh, he was a chief architect for Auroville and I had collaborated with him for 17 years and uh, I am still, um, I don't live there anymore, I live in Berlin, but I am uh, still following some of his visions for urbanism and um, in a recent exhibition which has opened up as I told you in Louisiana, I have 
um, I'm showing one of these urban uh, design projects where it's a, a, a cluster of 60 to 80 people co-housing that, uh, you know, has been all, uh, you know, it's an alternative to the tower. It still is a high density prototype where the pedestrian mobility is included on various levels of the building and it does not have any footprint alongside the building. So this is, these are projects I'm doing, which I would want to end with to explain that there is an interdisciplinary approach towards it and a collaborative practice. This is with Jan Gale getting feedback on a student uh, research of the same project. When I was in Stuttgart, he was advising on mobility or here you see in Louisiana, we have had students exploring different possibilities inside this kind of a space where the urban design is built in one to 50. It's a two 20 meter long model that you can go and see, but it also includes what my students are able to do. So with this, I would like to um, end my talk and say that I think uh, we don't have to be in a hurry to save time. We should befriend the time of our own lifetime and have a good relationship with it so that we can actually have an enriching life and we could also take time to have a good contact to ourselves, a good contact to our community and to the habitat, which is the earth, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, it's not about artificially having a relationship with nature, but the air we breathe, the water we need, we, we are part of a, a larger habitat and we should take the time to not only inhabit our spaces consciously, but also inhabit our time because uh, it's the most valuable underrated resource, but that's all we have as humans when we are alive. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do have a, a question I want to start us off with. Um, you know, just regarding you know the the concept of taking time in construction, but also pitting that against kind of the the rapid expansion of of humans across the world. You know, how I'm wondering how best do you think it is to balance um, like the 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 slower, I guess, more traditional vernacular architectural methods with this like rapid expansion that we're seeing? I think that um, slow doesn't have to mean traditional. I'm not traditional, you know, but I don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if I don't have time, if I'm so fast that I don't have time to live, then why am I doing all that? That's what I'm asking. And I'm saying that everything that we created is not as if we did it because it was better. When you don't take time to think, you don't know if it's better or not. You're just doing things out of habit. Even people who are educated are doing things out of habit because we are not taking the time to take audit. What is it that we really need? Do we really, do you think building is a way out of every problem? Every time there's a problem, if there's COVID, do you immediately need to now build more to solve it? Is it not an artificial problem created to enrich people who feel that we have to boost the economy, you know? Um, I think, I, I question that. I don't agree with, I don't, I don't want to waste time. I want to go, uh, see, I don't want to go in the opposite direction of my goal. But when you don't think, I think we, a lot of things that are created in our cities, I mean, uh, do, we, do we feel that our cities are better are we happier? Are we, uh, are, do we have a consensus on that? I think we do. And most people say that it was not better. So therefore they look upon traditional as a nostalgic thing, as if it was better earlier. It was not better earlier. We are better off today because we have more, we, we as humans, evolution happens, we are better off. But even in spite of being better, we are putting up with bullshit sometimes. Sorry, I'll cut that out. But my question Th thank you very much for your incredibly uh, beautiful view on uh, uh, the earth, on people, and uh, how actually to live a life in a way that we are not used to anymore. 
Uh, but I'm only interrupting right now because I would like Joshua to introduce himself for the for the recording. Uh, oh. <laughs> so that we can do this first, and the other students who will ask questions, please introduce yourself too. Uh, first, Joshua, please. Absolutely, yeah. So I, I am Joshua Fox. Um, I'm with the University of Oregon uh, Department of Architecture as an undergrad student, uh, third year studying architecture. Uh, there are other questions. I think we have some more questions. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Amisha. I'm a graduate student at University of Oregon in the architecture program. And um, I just first of all want to really thank you for sharing with us. I feel incredibly lucky to have been able to hear about your work this morning. Um, I find this, uh, this sort of reassessment of values really refreshing. Uh, coming back to school, this is part of what I wanted to, to study, how to do this better. Um, I noticed there was a time where you said it was ironic to call you a material researcher. Um, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit more on that. Yeah, because I was not materialistic, you know, in that sense. I felt I always, all the architecture I studied in the old school way was that architecture is about the space, we the void. You know, they say the function of the pot lies in its nothingness. It's the part you didn't build is what humans will occupy, right? So I, I, I still believe that. But I thought that that gave me the liberty to be not looking upon any material in a fetish way, you know, like I need this marble from Italy or I need this aluminum because wow, I've seen this new material. So I just felt like since the material is immaterial as it were, why should we create such a big impact from the materiality? And now I'm noticing the materiality of the architecture and of post-industrial architecture has come at such a high negative impact that it cannot be ignored. And by then I developed the skills to, because I had, had I'd gone to places where I felt like it would make no sense to bring in a standardized solution. So I, it, it was very, very time intensive but very rewarding and I in fact because of that I know my first principles and I know what I need so I cannot be in the myth that something random is better I know when a standard material is has advantages but I also know when I'm not going to use it I'm not enslaved I can think for myself you know mm -hmm. and if the machines don't serve us we don't need them I won't I would try to keep the human life sent in the center so human life people who users who occupy architecture they are interested in the void and the void's relationship to the outside void that means the air light how does it come in how porous is it but the other thing is the people who build and a lot of us are involved in the building part of it we they are interested in the materiality so we have to care about the material is it healthy where does it come from how does it affect Econo economy also, you know, is it be benefiting local economy? Whom, whom would it benefit if I build with this or that? And when you don't know about it, you tend to like certain things. But if you allow knowledge to shape you, you become cultured and refined and you start liking things that are actually good for you rather than just liking it because of a trend or because of your ignorance. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but... Yeah, I think that was a great answer. I, uh, is there any other question? Because I have one question that we cannot avoid, uh, uh, Anupama. That is, you are, you are using the word beauty in uh, different ways. And uh, uh, how does it relate to, to uh, uh, your, what you have presented to us this uh, morning so far? Because you are talking about people at the center of life and uh, uh, how you look at material and how you use everything, whatever you find. I mean, it's a beautiful approach to, 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 to this, but I'm using the word beautiful now too. What is your notion of beauty? I'm very interested. My students are interested in it because we are just talking about this in one of our studios. In fact, uh, there is a recorded session with me somewhere on the net, which is about beauty alone. Uh, it's with the Italian embassy. Anyway, I also used, I think, ugly as often as I use beauty because a lot of people don't know what they don't agree on what is they find beautiful, but they all agree that almost everything is ugly 
and ugliness is being produced at a high speed is something I keep hearing. So I think I'm not the only one who thinks so. Uh, but uh, my notion of beauty is, is that beauty is not something when people don't have time to cultivate themselves. Beauty is not something that you can pass through beauty and you will not even notice it. You could be sitting next to a very beautifully acknowledged to be beautiful art or furniture. You may feel nothing because you're in a hurry or you don't even, you don't in general are not present. There could be many reasons why people don't cultivate. So I think beauty is a matter of cultivating it's something to do with cultivating us who we are. So beauty is not, is about the beholder. You know, it's about, uh, it's something to be, you know, the more problems I saw in Bombay and all the ugliness I saw uh, before I learned about beauty and all that through my own work to refine myself and my eye and my mind, I realized that I was so longing for beauty in the terrible world of things I saw that I used to always try to either zoom out or zoom in and you always found beauty at some scale, you know, even in the ugliness. Like if you just zoom into, you look into a microscope, again, blood starts looking like something, kaleidoscope, everything looks like something else. You look at things, so the way you look at a thing, so this, I think beauty is something we all seek. And that's a poetry, it's something we seek these qualities. It's not the material again. That's why I mentioned that I never expected to land up being called the material person or whatever, because I was so actively seeking the non-material so that the material could be transcended. I was always seeking to transcend the material so that that is the human experience. I feel that is that experience, if we can have it, we don't need a lot of material. Look, a big, a big budget does not ensure a better movie, right? We know that. So we, we don't, but there is this association of beauty, uh, either that it's frivolous and some people make you feel guilty if you seek beauty because they think, oh, look at them. They are thinking only about beauty when there's so many problems. So, you know, there are a lot of things, but I think beauty is something super, I mean, it's, the, it's about harmony. It's about, uh, you know, you know when it's not solved if we didn't arrive at beauty. So I think beauty is, is the essential thing. And if you have a very beautiful space, you will realize that you don't want any redundant object in it. And in fact, I'm very uh, looking up to the Japanese, you know, for that. I have to say that because I hope my dream is to have enough time to go and learn Ikebana. This is always my childhood dream because that's where you know what is beauty. There's no two ways about it. Every child knows when you turn a flower arrangement, if it's not balanced from everywhere, it's not done. So beauty is uh, something so very refined. And yet everybody needs it. And everybody see, I mean, if you can spend time seeking it and delivering it, I think we will also again save a lot of materials because we realize half of the things we would rather enrich our landscape if we didn't do our activities. So that's why COVID is refreshing. Abunama, thank you very much for a beautiful uh, answer to beauty. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure there are any other questions. You know, I unfortunately have to leave you and yes, go I to- know. I'm just, uh, just want to make sure that you get to your appointment. Uh, I want to well, thank, thank you, you all for your you. interaction and I wouldn't want to, um, Hiroto and Naomi, I'm going to see your work, but I want to interact with you because I was really <laughs> looking forward as a you know, feelings towards ja ja Japan, you know, uh, yeah. in terms of beauty and the way I feel they work with symmetry and non-symmetry. It's something mm -hmm. I hope yes. to discuss with you one day, separately. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. And I'll look, look at your recording. Yeah. Thank, you you. thank you very right. much, Anupama. That was a wonderful lecture. Thank, thank you Thank you, all. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you.